Hey, welcome to our event today. Who is Ana Belen Montes? Who is Ana Belen Montes? Spy, traitor, Puerto Rican, Cuban, uh, dissident, revolutionary, mental. reactionary, mental patient. There's a lot of information that's out there. Half of it is true, half of it is not. The other half is evolving. Well, actually, bad math. I'm not a math teacher, folks. I'm a history teacher. <laughs> one third of it is true. One third of it is um, conjecture. And one third of it is still evolving. I want to thank all of you for coming out. I want to thank Freedom Hall for sponsoring us today. I also want to thank La Mesa de Trabajo de Ana Belen Montes. That's the working group or working table, literal translation uh, from Puerto Rican Spanish. Uh, which is an organization that exists both in Cuba and in Puerto Rico that has been raising awareness around Ana Belen Montes. They actually sent us a statement we will be sharing later, and they are the ones that have really been asking us in the diaspora, especially in the United States, to start mentioning that name, Ana Belen Montes, as much as possible. Because right now, the overwhelming majority of us think that there's only one Puerto Rican political prisoner left, and unfortunately, we have two and we still have work to do. So why are we here today? Well, brothers and sisters, I think we're here today because we need to build solidarity, and that's why a portion of our activity here is based on building awareness around Mumia, Leonard Peltier, the Move Nine, many of the Jericho political prisoners, because like Oscar Lopez once stated, if we do not build unity and solidarity, then none of our nations will be free. Sure. And the Puerto Rican community is not the only ones that are going to free Oscar. It is going to be all of us united. That's how we had that victory take place in 1999 when 11 of them got clemency and how the Cuban five were free because that was an international victory and how some of the brothers and sisters from the Black Panther, BLA, um, New African movement have been freed that took place last year in 2015 and some of the recent victories mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. That took place because we were working together. And right now, Ana is going to be freed because all of us are working together. I want to share a statement. Oscar Lopez Rivera on Ana Belen Montes. Solidaridad entre preso político. Solidarity amongst political prisoners. Various friends and compañeros have asked me how I would feel about having Ana Belen Montes' name alongside mine in the campaign for my freedom. It would be a great honor for me. I think that every Puerto Rican who loves justice and freedom should be proud of Ana Belen. What she did was more than heroic. She did what every person who believes in peace, justice, and liberty would do. It's the right of every nation to govern itself in the best way possible and without intervention or threats from anyone. She did what she did because she knew that the government of the United States was intent on destroying the Cuban government and imposing on the Cuban people a system designed by Washington. One more attempt at regime change. The, object the objectives of the U.S. government were criminal, and if she hadn't acted as she did, she would have been supporting those criminal actions. We should all be proud of her, support her, and demand her release from prison. I know for a fact that Oscar would say that about many of the political prisoners that are in jail today. The over 200 political prisoners that exist in this country that are not recognized by the United States. Because according to the United States, their nice little statement that they read at the United Nations, the United States does not have political prisoners. Yeah, right, yeah. Because this is a country where everyone and anyone has the right to express whatever <laughs> political opinion they have. And that no one in this country is ever incarcerated or a victim of oppression for their political beliefs. This is what they say at the United Nations. And at a lot of the human rights, a, a lot of the human rights meetings and conferences, the Puerto Rico Decolonization Committee hearings, the United States is somewhere where no one faces oppression for having a deferring political belief. Tell that to all of our brothers and sisters behind the walls and those that have been murdered yes, by yes. the U.S. government. Yes.
So brothers and sisters, we need solidarity. And tonight, again, a portion of our campaign and our activity today is dedicated to our brothers and sisters behind the walls. So I wanna present first Professor Joanna Fernandez of the campaign to bring Mumia home, who's gonna talk to us about one of Puerto Rico's greatest allies, which is Mumia Abu-Jamal. Free Mumia. Free Mumia. I'd like to thank Ben Ramos for, uh, for organizing this because this is exactly the direction in which we need to move. Our political prisoners have been imprisoned for decades uh, and we stand in a nation that doesn't acknowledge the fact that there are political prisoners. I would say that of all the political prisoners, the Puerto Rican example, because Puerto Rico is the oldest colony in the world, um, the experience of the Puerto Rican political prisoners is the most explicit one, politically speaking. And that's why we need to come together, um, not as isolated cases involving Native Americans, involving African Americans, Mexicans. We need to come together um, as a people, colonized and oppressed and raised the issue of political imprisonment in the United States. And I know we were talking outside about the importance of taking this message to the people mm -hmm. this summer, in the streets, in our neighborhoods, in the yes. South Bronx. There's an urgency. People are paying attention to what's happening in the world, and this is an opportunity um, to raise the voices and the names of our political prisoners who in many ways are the people who have the best analysis of the crisis we're yes, living in absolutely. today. And we can't forget that because these are the organic intellectuals of our movements that have been in prison precisely because of their analysis, exactly. because their analysis is dangerous. I will say that um, we in the Mumia movement descended this morning uh, on a conference that was being organized at um, the New School. This is a uh, conference around mass incarceration. Uh, uh, it was an academic conference, but it also brought together students from all over the country who were doing projects on mass incarceration, taking classes on mass incarceration, and going into the prisons mm -hmm. to talk to prisoners. It was a really interesting and fascinating space, mm -hmm. however, the issue is that in all conversations around mass incarceration, political prisoners are never found. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to change that. That's true. In part, what I've argued in my work is that the intensification of uh, political imprisonment happened in the 60s when our people were in motion. Mm -hmm. And so it is in the 1960s, 70s, and 70s that a large number of uh, political prisoners who are active in uh, the movements of our people get criminalized. Mm -hmm. And so if you remember, some of you who, are, uh, who were active during that period, we were launching campaigns in the 60s to free Angela, to mm -hmm. free this one, to free the other one. Um, and so the criminalization and law and order campaign that we know to be associated with the 80s and 90s really began with an attack and criminalization of our freedom fighters mm -hmm. and their imprisonment. In the 1980s and 90s, that project of incarceration was then deployed against our communities mm -hmm. en masse. So we have to repeat over and over again that this project of mass incarceration really began in the 60s mm -hmm. against our freedom fighters. Um, so we were at this conference because John Wetzel, the head of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, was invited to frame the discussion. Huh. A man who has blood in his hands. Unbelievable. And who is presiding, is presiding over the most brutal uh, carceral state in the nation, second only to Texas. So Pennsylvania um, has more young people doing um, life in prison without parole right. than any 
other state wow. in the nation, second only to Texas. Mm -hmm. Right now in um, Greatersford, which is a prison in Pennsylvania, we have been told by, by our people that the water source is poisoned. Mm -hmm. The guards go in with their flasks of water, mm -hmm. many of them. They do not drink the water in the prison, and even the guards have alerted us that there is a problem. And uh, we called the Department of Corrections Secretary, John Wetzel, to talk about this, and he has said nothing. Mm. John Wetzel is also the man who is blocking health care mm -hmm. and medical care for Mumia, who has hepatitis C, um, and even their own attorneys and their own doctors have admitted that it's very likely that uh, Mumia has a serious uh, uh, problem in the liver. Mm -hmm. There's a 63% chance, according to their own um, findings, that Mumia probably has a serious liver problem. And, and John Wetzel, in December, essentially hired lawyers to challenge our suit to the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Corrections, demanding that Mumia be treated immediately because as all of you know he fell into a deep crisis mm. but it's not just about Mumia there are 10,000 um, prisoners in Pennsylvania with uh, hepatitis C mm. and there are thousands of prisoners across the country also with hepatitis C Seth Hayes is sick um, our prisoners are aging, and this is a crime against humanity that um, these prisons in the United States, the nation that dares to call itself the land of the free, <laughs> is refusing um, to treat this, uh, this crisis of health in the prisons. Uh, so that's really the latest. It was very difficult for us to intervene in that conference because it seemed to be a conference that was on our side. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they had John Wetzel, who presented himself as this liberal oh. reformer who was going to save the system. Oh, yeah, right. So we <laughs> had a big fight, and we finally embarrassed him um, and challenged him. And I begin my remarks with that statement because it is time to take our struggles and the issue of political prisoners to where people are. This is the time for us to go and each one teach one because a lot of people don't know about our, our political prisoners. Right. When the hundreds of people who were there heard that there was this problem with health care in the prisons, they were shocked. Mm -hmm. um, they were shocked that the attorney that was hired by John Wetzel, the head of the DOC, falsified a document and she was discovered in the hearing in court. It was the last thing she imagined was gonna happen, that this mm -hmm. falsification of a document um, was, uh, was discovered. And essentially, she falsified a document written by their doctors. She changed the story around in order to get the judge to throw out the case wow. before our hearing um, took place. And our attorney, Bob Boyle, he didn't know that the document was falsified. So when their doctor was called on the stand, he said, doctor, this is uh, the affidavit you signed. I just want you to familiarize yourself with the affidavit because I'm going to ask you questions. And the doctor himself, which was hired by the Department of Corrections, said, hold on. I didn't sign this document. Right. Wow. I signed everything wow. but paragraph number 21. I did not agree with paragraph 21, and I had a conversation with the lawyer uh, of the DOC, Laura Neal, and I explained to her that as a doctor, I could not agree to this statement because this statement is not medically accurate, and it suggests that Mumia is not as sick as he actually is. The judge who was presiding over this hearing said, intervened and told the, law, the, 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 the lawyer of the DOC who was baffling, you know, she was essentially nervous of and she was trying to make up a story. And the lie was so clear, 
that the judge told her, ma'am, it is my responsibility as the judge to ask you to remain silent because you are about to perjure your witness, the mm -hmm. doctor that you brought on, this, on the stand. My question to, to um, John Wetzel, who spoke this morning at a, um, at a panel titled, What is Crime and Who is a Criminal, mm -hmm. is, is that's not the question. The question is who goes to jail. Right. Mm -hmm. Because the criminals don't. Because Laura Neal, who lied in court and essentially jeopardized the life of Mumia Abu Jamal and all those who have hepatitis C, she's not going to jail. She's not going to jail. Mm -hmm. um, and and the people who are responsible for the crisis in Puerto Rico, the economic crisis in Puerto Rico, which is connected to the U.S. Imperial Project. Mm -hmm. This is a crisis that um, is starving prisoners, by the way. I don't know if you mm -hmm. read the article that appeared not long ago that prisoners in Puerto Rico can't get food because of the economic crisis. Mm -hmm. So that means that prisoners in Puerto Rico are dying because they can't get food and they can't get proper medical care because of the crisis. Those people who created the crisis are not going to jail. The people who go to jail are the people who stand up for the freedom of Puerto Rico, like Oscar Lopez. The people like Mumia Abu Jamal, like the Move Nine, like Leonard Peltier. Um, so this is a narrative that we have to, and an analysis that we need to bring to our people. Yes. The people who heard this from us thanked us. They initially were, you know, yeah. you know, this is we're on your side. Why are you protesting in our, in our conference? Uh, but when they actually heard the story that John Wetzel is essentially trying to uh, give a facelift to the brutal system in Pennsylvania, once they heard the truth, they were like, okay, we want to have a conversation with you. I know that others have to speak. I just want to say that just two months ago, I read um, the chapter in this book on the irradiation campaign mm -hmm. that was launched mm -hmm. by the United States, yes. mm -hmm. which irradiated over a thousand prisoners here in this country, among them Albizu right. Campos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a harrowing crime against humanity that was begun in Puerto Rico. Um, because Puerto Rico, we know, is the laboratory of the United States for all of the horrible things that it wants to do in Latin America and around the world, it tests that project out in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, wow. When I was reading this, all of the symptoms that Mumia had were the symptoms that Don Pedro Albizu wow. Campos had. Wow. It, was, it raised my right. hairs, yeah. Right. Yeah. swollen legs, uh -huh. sores on his legs, mm -hmm. arms and torso. Mm -hmm bluish marks on his skin, facial and neck swelling, mm -hmm. raw peeling skin on his hands and feet, high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. These are all of the symptoms that Mumia was really? gripped with. You probably read about it mm -hmm. um, last year. Our struggles um, have to engage in solidarity because we face the, the same enemy. Yeah. Uh, on the weekend of April 22nd through the 24th, we are descending on uh, the uh, uh, in Philadelphia. We are marching to the governor's office to demand that he take a stand on this issue of hepatitis C, that he grant the medication to Mumia, but to all the other prisoners right. with hepatitis C. Russell Maroon Schultz, as you know, is another political prisoner in Pennsylvania. He is also aging and he is very sick yes. and he needs our support. Yes. Uh, we are also having, so the march to the governor's office is on Friday, April 22nd. We're delivering petitions demanding that this hepatitis C uh, crisis be addressed because there is a cure for hepatitis C. Right. On April 23rd, the <clears throat> next day, we're going to have a march through the hood to essentially educate our people about this crisis. And we ask that you join us. There is a bus leaving from here, from New York to um, Philadelphia. And then on um, the 24th, which is Mumia's birthday, mm -hmm. Sunday, we're having a fundraiser and um, uh, uh, 
a bash. We're going to party for his birthday. So that's really the latest on Mumia. Mumia, I, I did speak to Mumia, and he does know that this is happening. And it was he who said that of all of the cases of political imprisonment, the one that the US government cannot deny is the one of Puerto Rico. Right. Because Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States and the oldest colony in the world. And he sends revolutionary gr greetings, and we're all fighting for the freedom of all of our political prisoners, especially our Puerto Rican ones. One of the worst acts of terrorism that's ever taken place in U.S. history took place in 1985 in Philadelphia, the bombing of the MOVE organization. To this day, that bombing, the ramifications and the consequences are still felt to this yes. day. We have MOVE political prisoners still in jail. I would love to ask Ori to give us an update as to what's happening, especially with the parole campaign that's coming up for the Sisters of the Move 9. Since 2008, our family became eligible for parole after serving 30 years of their minimum sentence. From 2008 up until as recent as February 2016, in the parole denial of Eddie Africa, our entire family has been denied parole by the PA Parole Board. Under the most questionable of circumstances, all right, you have people that have met all of the requirements and have had home plans set up for housing, they've had employment set up, they've had at least six to seven of them have had recommendations by the superintendents of these prisons to be paroled and the support of the community welcoming them back into the community. But they have been denied parole on a consistent basis based upon a vendetta by the Fraternal Order of Police. The same group that has lobbied for the execution of Mumia Abu Jamal for over 30 years now. The same group in conjunction with the FBI who has worked to keep Leonard Peltier in prison who has worked to keep Sundiata Coley in prison, yep. who fought right here in New York City when the offer was made for clemency for the Puerto Rican mm -hmm. political prisoners, mm -hmm. who's fighting to keep Jaleel Muntikim and Herman Bell and Seth Hayes in New York State prison. So their parole denials aren't based upon a completed parole package. It's based upon a police vendetta against anyone who's got up and took a stand against the police and whose case revolves around the murder of a cop. Mm -hmm. What the parole board is doing is what Judge Malmed did in 1980, and that sentenced our family to life in prison. The parole board is resentencing mm -hmm. our family to life in prison. You know, our brother Phil Africa saw the parole board at least six times and died under mysterious mm -hmm. circumstances in 2015 in these prisons. We have serious work to do. Our sisters are coming up for parole this May 2016. This would be either their seventh or eighth parole mm -hmm. hearing. Now, I've lost count. I've lost count, but we have work to do. Our sisters have the support of the community, the support of their family. The excuse that the parole board is using now is they're, they're deemed as a risk to the safety of the community. Oh. What community? You know, the people that murdered Michael Brown, they still walk the community. The person that murdered Akai Gurley still walks the community. I feel unsafe with these people being on the streets. You know, Hilton Vega, Anthony Rosario, Eleanor Bumpers, Gillian, Gideon Bush. The, the, the names go on and on, but the point is these murderers are still walking the street. But here we have innocent freedom fighters who got up and took a stand against something. And they're being labeled as criminal, being labeled as murderer. What's criminal is the fact that you have a case that revolves around the murder of a police officer. Yet you have former police officers sitting on the Pennsylvania parole board. You know, overseeing a case that revolves around the murder of a cop. That is a complete conflict of interest. But the point I'm making, for three years now, we've come at the Pennsylvania Parole Board. We have literally taken away every excuse they have had. We have shown that our family is not a risk to the safety of the community. 
How can people who's kept down gang and racial violence in prison be a threat to the safety of the community <clears throat> when prison officials are coming to them asking them to squash gang riots or gang violence that's about to happen? You know, through this campaign, we've exposed the nature of the Pennsylvania Parole Board. Who's on the parole board? For example, Michael L. Green was the chairman of the Pennsylvania Parole Board. This was a man that was appointed to the Pennsylvania Parole Board by then Governor Ed Rendell, mm -hmm. who finally, you know, Ed Rendell was the prosecutor mm -hmm. in the case of the Move Not, built a career off of the backs of Mumia Abu Jamal and the Move organization. Green recently made chairman of the Pennsylvania Parole Board. And the point we made, when our brother Eddie Africa went up for parole, we said, no, enough's enough. This is a complete conflict of interest here. This man cannot have a decision over our brother's hearing. Okay, this would be unfair. This would be biased. As usual, Eddie was denied. But our movement sent a loud and clear message to these officials. Literally one month or less than a month after Eddie was denied, Michael L. Green was removed as chairman of the Pennsylvania Parole Board. Not only was he removed, but he was removed from the parole board altogether. Randy Feathers, another former cop who was on the board, was removed from the parole board. This entire parole board is corrupt. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not one for politics or political change. Or that. That's just not my thing. But if we're going to have a parole board, it needs to be community control mm -hmm. of the parole board itself, where the community has a say so over the parole board. Absolutely. Like we said, we have a parole campaign going. Our sisters are going before the parole board this May. Uh, people can go to www.onamove.com. We have a. Um, uh, move 9 parole blogspot.com or justice for the move 9 if you're on Facebook and we have the numbers up there we're urging people to call the per the governor's office every Monday sign the petition online where we're demanding that the US Justice Department investigate the ongoing and wrongful imprisonment of the move 9 this campaign we started it in support of our family but this work supports everyone in the parole process not just on a scale of parole, but the fight to free our political prisoners mm -hmm. and exposing and pushing back the hands of law enforcement in this matter. Because like I said, the same law enforcement that's keeping our family in prison is fighting to keep Leonard in prison. Mm -hmm. It's fighting to keep Oscar in prison. We've taken away the excuses of the parole board and the next step we have taken is we're going straight at the law enforcement now. Because this parole issue here it's not about the parole board and our family. It's about the FOP mm -hmm. giving the orders to keep our family in prison. Absolutely. And that's the issue that we're tackling now. It's, just, it's not no longer about parole packages or the phone calls. We took away the excuses of the parole board and dismantled them. Our movement now has the governor of Pennsylvania demanding liberal cries, making liberal cries for change within the parole board to the point where he wants to dismantle the parole board and put the parole board in the hands of the Department of Corrections now and let the prisons make the decision if people should be paroled. And this is a good thing because the people like Russell Maroon Schultz or the elderly population in prison who have life can get early parole or some type of parole off of this issue. I'm not saying they're going to do that, but our movement can force that. Look at the movement for juvenile lifers how that got overturned mm -hmm. and now they have to release juvenile lifers. Right. It's in our hands. We can get anything that we want. It may seem impossible, but if we work toward it, we can get it. There's an interesting history that we have as Boricuas with Leonard Peltier. Um, Leonard Peltier was arrested and went to jail. He met a man named Rafael Cancel Miranda, That's right. a revolutionary Puerto Rican nationalist. Uh, they forged a friendship, and uh, Ra Don Rafa became kind of a mentor to Leonard, uh, teaching him how to be a political prisoner behind the walls. Don Rafa is freed. Leonard is in jail. Many years later, a young man named Luis Rosa, mm -hmm. who had been arrested 
for the crime of being a Puerto Rican revolutionary fighting for the independence of his nation, goes to jail and meets Leonard Peltier. And Leonard Peltier passed along that mentorship to Luis. <laughs> so there's this history that we have with our brother, Leonard. Um, and because of that, we keep that solidarity and that history alive. And we're going to ask Maggie from New York City, free Leonard Peltier, to speak about um, what's happening with Leonard right now. Professor Fernandez said earlier, people don't know that we have political prisoners here. That's, That's very true. But what saddens me is many people who were aware of it have forgotten them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They've forgotten them. When we table very often, People come up and say, is Leonard still in prison? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the case with a lot of other prisoners. Mm -hmm. People have forgotten them. Yes, they have. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, is a terrible situation. And as everybody here is saying, we have got to do something about that. We have got to make people aware that they're still there. People, I've heard also people say, some of those Panthers are still in prison. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. Leonard has been in prison for a little over 40 years. He's 71 now, and he's very yeah. sick. Yeah. He's, and this is another problem, as we've heard about Mumia. Medical care in prison is abysmal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible thing. Uh, Leonard has diabetes. He's had it for years. There's an epidemic of diabetes in prison. Mm -hmm. And now we hear the hepatitis C epidemic. Yeah. Leonard has had a stroke, which cost him the sight in one eye, and he's recently been diagnosed with an abdominal aortic aneurysm. This is life-threatening. Yep. If it burst, he could bleed to death. I haven't had any word about what they're doing now. The prison has decided to wait and watch, which is a legitimate way of looking at this. I went on the Mayo Clinic website right away to see what was happening, and they said waiting and watching is legitimate. Apparently, it's very small. But it's very frightening. He is very frightened about this. Sure. And when it comes to parole, Leonard was up for parole in 2009. Yeah. Of course, he's a federal prisoner, so it's a little different from some of these state situations. He was turned down. They said, come back in 15 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If he's alive, he'll be 80. Yeah. That's 2024. 20, yeah. His only hope now is clemency from the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. He applied for clemency before. Yes, we did. And it sat there for a while, the, the appeal. The pardon attorney recommended it. Mm. Yeah, the pardon yes, attorney. They did a long, mm -hmm. long investigation, and the pardon attorney recommended um, that he get clemency. And Clinton didn't Trump. do it, because, yeah. as we've heard here, the FBI made sure. 500 FBI agents marched around the White House. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. And he was passed over. He's applied again. He applied in February. And that's Leonard's only hope. All of the other legal resources, it's over. And Leonard's case <clears throat> is very similar to a lot of other cases. He didn't do what they've been accused of and, and, and convicted of. But somebody has to pay. Exactly. They don't care. Mm -hmm. it, reminds, it reminds me a little bit of the old the lynchings in the South. Yeah. And not, not just in the South. There were plenty of lynchings in the North as well. Somebody would say, oh, this, this Negro, they would say, did something or other. Mm -hmm. The first one who comes along, they grab him. And women, too, were lynched. People don't realize how many women were lynched as well. And somebody has to pay. They don't always care who, but somebody has to pay. And they, and they, and they just don't want them ever to get out. Another problem is the system here is very, very vindictive. Absolutely. What harm are these people going to do? Some of these political prisoners they're in wheelchairs. They're building geriatric centers for prisoners in general. Mm -hmm. But these people are sick. When they get out, they might get a little bit better medical treatment, but they don't have long lives to live. If you're 70 years old in prison, your actual life is more like 80. Mm -hmm. right. prison, prison really adds years to your life, what you go through. Poor food, 
poor medical care and the tremendous stress the prisoners are under. Yes. The stress is enormous for all prisoners and perhaps a little bit more for political prisoners because they are singled out. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about that, they are singled out. Absolutely. And you wonder, why are they keeping him in prison? Why? As Ori mentioned, the MOVE women, they've been wonderful. And there is no point in it except this is a very vindictive culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The latest campaign for Leonard is we're trying to get Obama's attention every which way we can. And we're asking people now to sign a postcard, fill out a postcard. And you can do it online. You can go to the website, which is www.whoisleonardpeltier.info, and you can, you can sign the postcard online. Somebody will actually, somebody in the committee will actually fill it out. And we are mailing hundreds of postcards. There's another organization in, uh, up in Buffalo. They have a postcard. Mm -hmm. Amnesty International just announced they are going to mount a major campaign to support Leonard. And they're talking about also having a postcard. So, <coughs> so, so we do have some hope. Uh, some people think we're wasting our time. It might be a long shot. But we're not giving up. Right. We're, we're trying to get Obama's attention every which way. So go online. Fill out a postcard and sign it. And, and you can also call the White House. Ah, call the White House, 202-456-1111. Call the White House and leave a message. Yep. Tell President Obama to grant clemency to Leonard or write a letter, a heartfelt letter. President Obama, the White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20500 write a heartfelt letter. It doesn't have to be a long letter. You don't have to go into the details of the case. Just say, it's time. It's time to let the healing begin. Free Leonard Peltier. Safia Bukhari, along with um, Albert Nora Washington, may yes. he rest in peace, and several other mm -hmm. political prisoners organized us into a massive march in New York City for the release of all U.S. held political prisoners. And after that march, Safia and many of the brothers and sisters had the foresight to know that a march is powerful, but it's something that happens in one day. Mm -hmm. And a movement doesn't win in one day. A movement mm -hmm. is built. It's mm -hmm. generational. It takes time. Yeah. So Safia and, again, many of the brothers and sisters that helped put that march together and the political prisoners and prisoners of war that supported it created the Jericho Movement. And it's a movement that is still is in existence fighting, basically, for the freedom of many of our political prisoners who aren't lucky enough to have support campaigns mm -hmm. and specific committees that are doing work. Jericho is that umbrella that brings us all together. And with that... I introduce one of the coordinators of New York City, Jericho, Ann Lamb. I mean, when I was young, I was working with um, the Chilean political prisoners after the coup in Chile in 1973. And a lot of them were saying, you know, it was interesting that they were being interrogated and there were U.S. psychiatrists there. Mm -hmm. And they were being given uh, antipsychotic medication in order to get them to talk. So this is mm -hmm. nothing new. Back then in the 80s, the Salvadoran political prisoners, same story. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of conversations with them. They were here. They testified at the UN. Uh, they were being given Thorazine. They were being given Haldol. They were being given Cogentin. All things to, you know, depress your will and try to get you to talk, you know. And so it was very interesting. You know, people I know personally have told me these stories, so I know them to be true. And, uh, you know, to see them doing this to Anna and also to other women political prisoners at Carswell, is very serious and we need to take this extremely seriously because we're getting to the point in this country you know where to think differently is going to be classified as a mental illness this is very problematic you know so much for your freedom there you know oh yeah you're perfectly free but you're nuts we'll, we'll lock you up and put you away but anyway i was going to talk a little bit it's hard because we did just lose two of our political prisoners we lost mando langa and then shortly afterwards we lost very unexpectedly, my friend Abdul Majid. We did work on a book together, Our Forgotten Political Prisoners in New York State. And the reason for that is because they feel totally forgotten, especially by their own community. 
uh, which is rather appalling. And as you say, we need to get out on the streets. We need to talk to the community. We need to do this work because I personally do not want to spend the rest of my life attending funerals of my friends. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to do that. That's not what I'm all about. I'm trying to pull these people out and get them home. And I also agree absolutely with what Ori was saying about the influence of the PBA and the FOP. It is horrible. And, you know, it just, the boards listen to them and they'll go along with what they say. So this is my brother, Robert Seth Hayes. Robert Seth Hayes, very good friend of mine, has been in prison, or has actually been convicted, in 1973. So he was first eligible for parole in 1998. All right, so he's been to the board all these times, just as the Moore family has, model prisoners, no infractions, mentored other prisoners, you know, help people get out, you know, and so on and so forth. In fact, he has a nice little quote here that he said, uh, after the death of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, Seth's unit, Seth was in the military, he was drafted and went to Vietnam, he's a decorated war vet, just like Oscar Lopez Rivera, Seth's unit was ordered to put down the rebellions resulting from Dr. King's assassination. It was the saddest day of my life, Seth remembers. I could never identify again with the aims of the armed forces or the government. Mm -hmm. So he joined the Black Panther Party when he came back from Vietnam. He was very involved with the free breakfast program. He, you know, did a lot of work around that. Um, he was convicted of killing a police officer, and that is why he's been in prison all these years because, and, I, and this brother is very sick. Uh, he's 67 years old now. Last year I was swore, you know, we would spend the whole year running medical campaigns for Seth. He weighed 129 pounds, right? He did finally get treatment for the hep C. He no longer has hep C. I just saw him on Sunday. You can see that just no longer having hep C, you know, his skin is better and all that. But unfortunately, Simultaneous to all that, he has diabetes, which he was diagnosed with in 2000, at the same time as the hep C, both of which he developed in prison. He also had this most horrible cough starting in March of last year, which was basically ignored by uh, the Department of whatever you want to call them. Uh, I can't call them correctional services and community supervision, but those folk. And uh, his wife was very concerned, Sheila, you know, we were talking on the phone. She was still going to their trailer visits at that time. They have the family reunification program where you can occasionally actually get to see your loved one, not in the visiting room, you know, in a little trailer that they have. And she said it was so bad, he would just be like leaning back on a couch watching TV, and he couldn't breathe. You know, he'd have to sit up because he couldn't breathe. He couldn't sleep at night because he couldn't breathe. So, you know, we're talking about this. We had, you know, Dr. Barbara Zeller and Dr. Lana Bosch, both of whom work with Jericho Medical Team, calling up to the prison, you know, calling up to Albany. People were calling up to Albany. We were calling up to Albany. Finally, in December, he collapses. He has to go every morning, of course, to get his sugar checked and get his, his, get his insulin, right? So he shows up, and he's there saying, you know, I don't really feel well, and being ignored, and he just fell on the floor. And we found out because one of his friends called Sheila. Because the prison, of course, is supposed to notify you, you know, when they take your loved one out to medical. Huh. Yeah, well, just like they did with Ms. Laborde, they didn't tell her either. All right, so um, she's in a panic. She calls me, which is very hard for her to do. And she said, call me back right away, because she was using somebody else's phone. And I said, what's going on, Sheila? And she said, I just got a call from one of Seth's friends. They don't know where he is. They took him out this morning, it was a Sunday. Um, and they hadn't told her anything. She was in panic because she didn't know where he was. She also has, I believe, has had a quadruple bypass. Mm -hmm. So her health is not the greatest either. So, you know, you're like, okay, Sheila, take a deep breath. Let's see what we can find out. And um, so the next day, they finally called her the following day at 4 o'clock to let her know that he was at Albany Medical Center. But there was a definite delay of at least 24 hours before she was notified. And then, of course, he's in prison ward, so he can't call but he was actually getting better treatment there. But they then diagnosed him now with congestive heart failure mm. and emphysema, mm. all right? Yeah, yeah, so now here's his poor brother. He's 67 years young, right? He's been a model prisoner. He's, you know, done all these good things inside. Every time he goes to the board, nature of the crime, right? The vindictive nature of these people. Mm -hmm. And then also my other big brother here, uh, I call them my big brothers because they are, uh, this is uh, 
Jalil Muntakim, also known as Anthony Bottom by the state. You cannot call him Jalil if you write to him. You must write to him as Anthony Bottom. He has been down. Oh my God, he's been down with the New York Three. That was him and Herman and Noah, right? And so he's been in, in since 1971 because he's including his California time. He was already in prison in California and then he was brought here for the other trial. So when Jaleel first went to prison, it's a very small picture there, but when Jaleel first went to prison, he was 19. He's now 64, all right? Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, 45 plus years, all right? And that was a case that went all the way up to Nixon. There's, you know, if you go to freejaleel.com, we have a whole booklet you can read, what the PBA doesn't want you to know about the New York Three, you know? And um, also model prisoners earn two bachelor degrees, one in psychology and one in sociology. He's worked as a pre-GED teacher's assistant. He's an office manager of the prison computer lab when they had that. Um, he also taught African studies. And he's a published author of essays and poetry. And uh, he also was uh, given awards twice for quashing riots. Mm. You know? So he's another one that they love to hate. And they write letters. The PBA writes letters against everybody here. You go to their website with one click of a mouse. You can sign a letter against parole for everybody they consider to be a cop killer. That doesn't mean just our people. There's a lot of other people who are not political prisoners who are getting the same hits. So this is very serious. They're both coming up to, oh, I should say, he's going on June 14th, birthday of one of my best friends on the planet, Ernesto Che Guevara. Let's give Ernesto Che Guevara a birthday present and pull this brother home. He's going June 7th, the week before, all right? They already turned down Herman, his co-defendant, was denied, right? Uh, Maliki Shakur Latin is going this month. So that's yet another brother. So hopefully he will not also be denied. We do have literature. I would encourage people to please take and take a card, take a threefold. It's got a little more detail. This is Seth with his wife Sheila when they got married, <laughs> right? And of course, who we are, very important. And as everybody has said, and we all agree, you know, we need to work together. We need to have solidarity with each other. I think Jericho has always tried to do that. You know, I was just speaking of New York State prisoners, but we also have several other prisoners in serious crisis. Matula was just turned down at the board. Uh, Dr. Matula Shakura, who should have been released, Max released in the feds 30 years. That's not happening. Uh, we could say Veronza Bowers, he should have been out in 2004, all right? So that's still pending in the courts, you know, going back and forth. Um, Luis Rodriguez just had a heart attack last week. They found him in his cell. They didn't know how long he had been there. He was rushed off to um, a hospital there in Frisco. I think it was Frisco. Well, anyway, somewhere in California. It might not have been Frisco. <coughs> and... <laughs> The doctors were amazed because they thought he was going to have neurological brain damage because they didn't know how long he had been oxygen deprived. No, he's fine mentally, but he needs a new heart. And this is like something that's impossible to get for a prisoner. Mm -hmm. You know, a heart transplant? Mm -hmm. You know, he's not going to be no high man on the, t on, the, on the totem pole. And then Alvaro Luna Hernandez was supposed, in Texas again, which is a horrible place, uh, was supposed to finally get hep C treatment and they were taking him to go get his hep C treatment, supposedly, and they put him into some like higher security classification and threw him in a shoe. So we have all this stuff going on, you know, it's, uh, it's very rare that we get good news. We did have some good news recently with Albert Woodfox, we're very happy about that. Also one of the young women who was involved with the Earth Liberation, we just released to a halfway house, we're very happy about that. But my whole goal in life is to bring our political prisoners home. And I happen to be wearing a shirt by Luis Rosa, yes, I which says, complete the mission. Bring them all home, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we still have not completed our mission. We have not brought them all home. And we need to do that. And I also just wanted to say, sorry for the uh, forgetting of the time on the leaflet, but right here on the 29th, two weeks, we are going to have a book party for Jaleel. Jaleel has wrote a book, or has written a book, Escaping the prison fade to black. Now, this is very interesting because he told his mom, his mom is an amazing human being, he says to his mom, I did something different, mom. And she says, yeah, what? Tony, because of course she always calls him Tony. 
And he said, well, I wrote a book of um, various different poetry, including a lot of erotic poetry. And she said, oh, send me a copy right away. <laughs> what? <laughs> His mom is amazing. His mom is like really an amazing human being. And I have to say that about all these guys' families. They are like so tremendous. And the family suffers too. And everybody should remember that. You know, Ms. Laborde, 93 years old, going up on those vans to visit her son, you know, bringing him food packages. And she told a funny story one time. Well, she didn't mean it to be funny, but it was funny. When he first got transferred to Elmira, Elmira's up on a big hill. It's like standing a castle on top of this big hill. Well, there's these stairs you can walk up like the city steps, right? <laughs> so she went on a weekend on a Sunday, and for whatever reason, something had happened the day before because normally they send a van down from the prison and you get in, in the van and they take you up the hill, the visitors. But somebody had said something to a CEO the day before, so they decided that nobody was gonna get in the van and everybody had to walk. So you could either walk up the big old hill, which winds around, or you can walk up the stairs, right? So she's talking to me on the phone and I, I said, well, Ms. LeBuck, because I had, you know, we were talking and I asked her how her visit was and she goes, well, it was very, very hard because of this incident, you know, where they didn't bring the van down. And she, of course, was bringing him a food package, I'm sure. And she said, you know, it was so sad because these two people in front of me, they were two old people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to laugh because I said, yeah, Miss LeBoyd, we know you're not old, you know. That woman is such a warrior for her son, you know. She raised his children, you know. Um, you know, so we see this kind of, you know, the, the loving mothers. I mean, Jaleel's mom, she just keeps saying, I, can I have my boy home before I die? You know, and we can understand that. That's human. You know, because political prisoners are not a picture on the wall. Somebody once said at a meeting that Mamiya was an icon. I was so furious. Mamiya is not an icon. Mamiya is a living human, breathing human being. We all are. All of these brothers and sisters, I've met the MOVE women. They are incredible, incredible human beings. And it's not only vindictive. I think there's more to it than that. I think the state is afraid of the ideas and the commitment and the example of our political prisoners. And they make that very clear. They're not, they're, it's more than vindictiveness, because it is that. It's all about revenge. But it's also all about, we're afraid what this man has to say. You know, we're afraid what this man's example can be. You know, we can't have the community knowing about these people. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons they really hate Mumia, because he writes books, he has his radio commentaries. <coughs> <coughs> they're, they're just hoping he will just shut up. And if the only way he, they can shut him up is to kill him, that's what they're going to try to do. So we really need to fight this. We really do. Bless you, Joe. And thank you, Ben. I didn't want to go on too long. You know, I get very emotional about this issue. <laughs> So brothers and sisters, one more time, please. I want to thank our panel for thank bringing you. the solidarity, bringing action. Um, this cannot be lost, brothers and sisters. There's an immediate urgency for solidarity Absolutely. for the sisters of the Move Nine, for yes. Leonard Peltier, for Mumia, for many of the brothers and sisters that are represented by Jericho. We need to go to those websites, we need to sign those petitions, we need to send in those postcards. You need to take three minutes out of your day to call the Philadelphia Parole, three minutes out of your day on Monday to call and leave a message, because that's essentially what most of us are doing. Right. We're leaving messages. Yeah. And those thousands of messages will be able to help our sisters. Now, brothers and sisters, who is Ana Belen Montes? It's difficult to say who she is. And I say that because as a nascent campaign, there's a lot of information out there that is constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. That's my nice way of saying that a lot of what's being put out there changes and sometimes is false. Mm -hmm. And I think a few months ago at another Pro Libertad event, I said, I've been changing the website and her biography over and over mm -hmm. because one sector says that date is off, that year is off. No, she didn't do that. No, that didn't happen when that happened and it's this way and not that way so brothers and sisters I'm presenting to you what today is information that I have on Anna this of course with the nature of her case and the fact that for more than 10 years now she's been in jail and this has been a non-issue yes this issue has become a movement in the last year since December 17th 
when um, Obama made his statement clear that you know there was going to be normalization and the mm -hmm. Cuban five were freed. So it, within this last year, things are evolving and we're learning who Ana Belen is. Brothers and sisters, I received a statement from Miriam Montes Mock, who is her cousin, who's a coordinator of La Mesa de Trabajo, the workshop for Ana Belen, the chapter that they have in Puerto Rico. As I stated in the beginning, there's two chapters that are actively organizing on the international level. One in Cuba, in La Habana, the other one in Puerto Rico. I want, I want you guys listen to what the Mesa has sent for us why she must be free there is a higher court than courts of justice and that is the court of conscience it supersedes all other co courts this quote comes from gandhi Ana Belen montes is a prisoner of conscience while working as a senior analyst in the defense intelligence agency at the pentagon she obeyed her conscience rather than the law and protected the cuban people against the united states government criminal United States government's criminal policies towards the island. Ana Belen Montes, who is close to 60 years of age, has already served more than half of her sentence without committing any infraction of prison rules. Meanwhile, she continues to serve a sentence under isolation. Mm. Ana Belen used her position in the Defense Department to assist Cuba in defending itself against the U.S. belligerent actions in the greater interest of seeing peace, harmony and friendship between the two countries with no intention of harming anyone through her actions. Ana Belen Montes was particularly interested in the normalization of relations between the United States and Cuba, which has been progressively implemented since December 17, 2014. In this declaration, in his declaration, President Barack Obama said, the United States is encouraged by the intention to open up to respectful relations and to cooperation between our two people and governments. 14 years earlier, Ana Belen Montes said, my greatest hope would be to see friendly relations emerging between the United States and Cuba. Ana Belen is far from being a violent criminal or a mercenary spy, but a peaceful person seeking better relations between the U.S. and Cuba. Under Obama's leadership, U.S.-Cuban relations have enjoyed a favorable upturn. With the, conscience, with the consensus of the U.S. intelligence community, the Republic of Cuba has been removed from the list of countries sponsoring terrorism. And this official pronouncement is explicit the reality that Ms. Ana Belen Montes is no threat to the national security of the United States. Ana Belen Montes' freedom will prove both an act of compassion as well as goodwill from the United States government towards creating peaceful and respectful relations between both countries. So some people may ask, okay, so she was working for the Defense Department? Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about the brothers and sisters that we talk about as political prisoners, not any of them work for the U.S. government. In fact, we were working against the U.S. government. Well, so was she, but she did it in a good way. Ana Belen, exactly. Ana Belen is an example of a woman whose conscience superseded the law. And that's a very powerful thing to say. This was a woman who was born... February 28th, 1957, in West wow. Germany, in a military uh, military base, base. Yeah. Uh, because her father was a military wow. army doctor. She's, wow. She was an army brat. She jumped yeah. around the world, Puerto Rico, the United States, Europe. Wow. Yeah. She comes from a very pro-statehood, pro-America, Puerto Rican family. Yeah. She graduated... In 1979, from the University of Virginia, with a degree in international relations. In 1985, she was hired by the DIA. For those of us who may not be aware, the DIA is a section of the American government that focuses on studying military maneuvers and military might of other countries. She was there as a specialist for intelligence investigation a few years after being hired in 1992 she's given her first assignment to go to Cuba she was given a fake title and said you're gonna go work at the American interest section in Cuba mm. saying that she would be a general worker at the interest section what she was really paid to do was to study the Cuban military 
1998, she goes back to Cuba as an observer for the, the visitation of Pope John Paul II. She was there to observe his visit. What she really was there was to continue studying the military and continue to meet with the dissidents mm. that are paid by our tax dollars mm. yes. to overthrow the, U the, the Cuban government. Mm. By 1998, when she did her second tour, she had actually been given a promotion. She wasn't just working for the DIA. She was now working for the Pentagon. Mm. And she became a part of a secret interagency working group that focused specifically on Cuba. The information they were gathering was going to be shared with the Pentagon, the White House, the CIA, and the FBI. Somewhere in the 90s, and this is where it's unclear, and despite having conversations with people who did not feel comfortable answering the questions via email or via telephone, said that sometime in the 90s, she underwent a crisis of ethics. Mm -hmm. She realized a lot of mm -hmm. what this country was planning to do, those assassination attempts, those overthrows, those funneling money and weaponry to dissidents was something that she could no longer support. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so she, for a period of allegedly 16 years, decided to share the information that she was sharing with the United States with the Cuban government. <laughs> she was never, <laughs> she was never approached by the Cuban government, paid by the Cuban government, was not technically a spy for the Cuban government. Not at all. Which is why when she was arrested on September 21st, 2001, they tried real hard to pin that espionage mm -hmm. charge on her the way they did with the Cuban <laughs> Five. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And much like with the investigation with the Cuban Five, when they looked through all mm -hmm. of that information and looked at people's backgrounds, they knew that she was not an agent of the Cuban. There was never an exchange from the Cuban government to her of money, resources, or anything. This was a woman who did this on a volunteer basis. And as we know, the US government, when they wanna charge you with something, oh, yeah. they will make it work one way or another, yeah. just like they did with the Cuban Five. We can charge you with espionage. You're not technically a spy, but conspiracy to commit mm. espionage. Right. That's a thought crime. I can't prove that you were thinking of something, but I'm pretty sure you were thinking of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that happened to the Cuban Five. That kept the Cuban Five in jail for 16 years. Yeah. The Patriot Act codified that. Yeah, yeah the Patriot right. Act has codified that. Yep. We, can, we will know, we know what you're thinking and we can't prove it, but we will say that you thought it at one point in time, now you get to go to jail. Mm. She was arrested September 21st, convicted and sentenced on October 16, 2002. Since then, she has been in jail. She was sent to the Federal Medical Center in Carswell, which is a medical, military medical hospital in an army base. She is in a psychiatric ward. Ridiculous. She has never been diagnosed with any psychiatric issue. But because of what she did right. and what she was thinking, she must be insane. Right, yeah. It has to be nuts. She must have some <laughs> form of mental illness. Mm -hmm. Besides being a traitor and treason and all that, she has mental illness. So what we're going to do is put her in a ward where she cannot really communicate with people because people on that ward have severe mental illness and are most of them are detached from reality. Mm, in the very true. beginning of her incarceration she wasn't allowed to receive visits from anyone except her immediate family oh, she was not a u allowed to use a telephone she wasn't allowed to receive mail she wasn't no one was able to find out about her health or uh, have her undergo any type of psychiatric conditioning or or analysis letters directed to her were returned by yes. certified mail she wasn't allowed to watch television or read the newspaper she was not allowed to interact with other inmates. Mm -hmm. She was not allowed to be around anyone who was not a prison official. Now, in the past few years, these things have changed. But the campaign of isolation is still there. She is still in a ward with people who have schizophrenia, people who have severe mental illness that are not 
coherent of the world around them. And that makes it very difficult to socialize and build yeah. social relationships. For A sure. lot of us here know our prisoners stay strong because of the social relationships they create. She cannot have conversations with people that are in catatonia or catatonic or with people who are just not aware of the world around them. Anna now can only receive correspondence from relatives or friends who belong to a limited list of 20 people. Yes. She now has access to books, magazines, and television. But the books have to be sent through bookstores, have to be sent through publishers. Mm -hmm. This also, these books rarely ever get to her when they're sent to her. Exactly. Anna can only receive visits from the same limited group of people on that 20-person list. She is only allowed to speak to her mother every other week. Mm. Even though now they say she's allowed to interact with other inmates, she can't. Right. There's a limitation there. According to the, the Federal Medical Center at Carswell, all of this is okay to do. Mm -hmm. This is appropriate punishment. Mm -hmm. there, this is a part of her, her sentence and that there's really nothing that can change on this. That is what they believe. Hmm. Right now, the movement to free Ana Belen is hmm. focusing hard on removing her from prison. We're focusing on getting her out of that psychiatric ward and getting her out of prison. And much like many of the campaigns that are have been talked about here, we have a postcard campaign, we have a letter writing campaign, we are going to be initiating, much like we have with Oscar Lopez Rivera, where the 29th of every month we're asking people to call Obama, we are focusing on the 28th of every month because her birthday is on February 28th of people calling and demanding that she be removed from that psych psychiatric ward and that she be released from prison. A 60 year old woman who made a moral decision, who saw what our government is sponsoring, doing, planning, plotting, made a decision to follow her conscience over the law. Yeah. We are building this movement, brothers and sisters, and I'm asking everyone that is here that when we have that discussion around Cuba, <coughs> when we have that discussion around Puerto Rico, that we mention Ana Belen Montes, sure. when we talk about the Move 9, we mention Oscar and Ana. When we talk about Oscar and Ana, we mention the Move 9 and Mumia and Leonard Peltier. Our united movement will free our nations, just like Oscar Rivera said. That's right. That's right. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot that we don't know and this case is evolving and a few months from now you'll he hear me do this presentation and maybe half of this will be edited and different <laughs> i can't i can't predict what information will be changing but brothers and sisters what i can predict is that we will be discussing and talking about ana belen montes as much as possible yes. and that when we organize our activities here there will be a section of solidarity we started in january with when we celebrated um at 1199 that fantastic party yeah, for yeah. oscar's birthday mm -hmm. where the most powerful thing that we heard one heard from was the testimonials of different political prisoners that had been freed like Sekou, mm -hmm. like Laura Whitehorn, like Cisco Torres. We're going to continue to build this solidarity and we're going to do it like Joanna said in the very beginning. We're getting back to the streets. Yes. This Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, mm -hmm. Pinterest world that we live in is no longer sufficient. You're right we need that. to go back to old technology. Mm -hmm. We need to go back out into the streets. and. We were already plotting and planning outside. Yes, we were. <laughs> in the summer, we are going to be in the South Bronx in El Barrio, and we're going to be talking about Leonard and Mumia and the Move 9 and the Jericho political prisoners, Oscar and Anna. And we need all of you here to support that. Don't you have here her sentence, her somewhere, her sentencing statement? We have our Anna Belen brochure here, and I will read her testimonial. It was wonderful. An Italian proverb perhaps best describes the fundamental truth I believe in. All the world is one country. In such a world country, the principle of loving one's neighbor as much as oneself seems to me 
to be the essential guide to harmonious relations between all of our nation neighbors. This principle urges tolerance and understanding for the different ways of others. It asks that we treat other nations the way we wish to be treated, with respect and compassion. It is a principle that tragically I believe we have never applied to Cuba. Your Honor, I engaged in the activity that brought me before you because I obeyed my conscience rather than the law. I believe our government's policy towards Cuba is cruel and unfair, profoundly unneighborly, and I felt morally obliged to help the island defend itself from our efforts to impose our values and our political system on it. We have displayed intolerance and contempt towards Cuba for most of the last four decades. We have never respected Cuba's right to make its own journey towards its own ideals of equality and justice. I do not understand why we must continue to dictate how the Cubans should select their leaders, who their leaders cannot be, and what laws are appropriate in their land. Why can't we let Cuba pursue its own internal journey, as the United States has been doing for over two centuries? My way of responding to our Cuba policy may have been morally wrong. Perhaps Cuba's right to exist free of political and economic coercion did not justify giving the islands classified information to help it defend itself. I can only say that I did what I thought right, to counter a grave injustice. My greatest desire is to see amicable relations emerge between the U.S. and Cuba. I hope my case in some way will encourage our government to abandon its hostility towards Cuba and to work with Havana in a spirit of tolerance, mutual respect, and understanding. Today we see more clearly than ever that intolerance and hatred by individuals or governments spread only pain and suffering. I hope for a U.S. policy that is based instead on neighborly love, a policy that recognizes that Cuba, like any nation, wants to be treated with dignity and not with contempt. Such a policy would bring our government back in harmony with the compassion and generosity of the American people. It would allow Cubans and Americans to learn from and share with each other. It would enable Cuba to drop its defensive measures and experiment more easily with changes. And it would permit the two neighbors to work together and with other nations to promote tolerance and cooperation in our one world country, in our only world homeland. <laughs> Not a radical. Not someone who spent their days reading Marxism and reading anarchism <laughs> and, and studying. And, and, <laughs> and I say that because... Ana changes the paradigm that a lot of us are used to when it comes to revolutionaries. Revolutionaries are incarcerated or assassinated. This was a woman who was very pro-US, very pro-Puerto Rican statehood. She's, she's writing wonderful things here around Cuba. I don't necessarily know what her stance on Puerto Rico is. I don't know, but what I do know is that this woman committed an extraordinary act of solidarity, yes, of did. love and support. And this is why we need to free her. Yes.